Dear Father in heaven, thank you again for the lessons that you taught us this morning in our Sabbath school lesson and in our sermon. Thank you that we have the privilege and the opportunity to trust and lean on you by faith. Thank you that you're there for us. We pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us this afternoon as we seek to understand which Bible we should read, which Bible we should use from the platform. And we just pray, Father, that as we study about the various Bibles today, that you would guide and lead us to hunger and to thirst after righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to start this afternoon by reading from a book that if you don't have this book, I would strongly suggest you get this book. It's called Vatican Assassins. Vatican Assassins. This book is about 700 pages long. And it takes a look at the rise of the Jesuit order and it comes all the way down to roughly the last major event it talks about uh, that I recall was the assassination of John F. Kennedy. If you need an address, uh, I would be happy to give you an address and or a phone number where you can order a copy of the book Vatican Assassins. In fact, as you notice uh, on the... Uh, picture on the cover, it has a bunch of spikes, and then in the middle it has I-H-S. This is a Jesuit symbol representing their power and authority. This is like their mark. And in the church where I went to preach last month in Los Angeles, right near La Sierra, after the morning meeting, when I had talked about how the Jesuit order had taken over all churches, a gentleman walked up to me after the service and he said, he said, look. And I said, yeah, it's, it's a nice pulpit, it's, it's nice wood. He said, no, look right here. So I went out and I looked right there on the front and they had this little piece of cloth that was, came down across the front of the pulpit. And right in the middle, it had a circle. And in the middle of the circle, it had I-H-S. Now this was a Christian, they call it the Arlington Christian Church. But right here on the cloth was a circle with I-H-S on it. identical to the picture on the front of this book. Now what that simply meant was is that that church was a part of and was underneath the authority of the Jesuit order. Now there's a man down in, I believe it's Coral Gables, Florida, by the name of D. James Kennedy. How many of you have ever heard of him? Dr. Kennedy. That's right, Graham. Dr. Kennedy. If anybody ever watches his program on Channel 55, and I quite honestly, I have not, but I was told that if you watch the beginning of his program, one of the symbols that you will see that is an identifying mark of his ministry is that. You will see this sign at the beginning of Dr. Kennedy's broadcast, IHS. Tragically, many Seventh-day Adventists support 
D. James Kennedy. Anyway, on page 267 of this book by Eric John Phelps, he quotes a statement that came from a conference or a council that was held at Cherie in 1825. At this council at Cherie in 1825, this was one of the things that the Jesuit order determined concerning the King James Version of the Bible. This is quoted in a book called, uh, let's see, The Engineer Corps of Hell. This is the statement. The Bible, the authorized King James Version of 1611, that serpent, which with head erect and eyes flashing, threatens us with its venom while it trails along the ground, shall be changed into a rod as soon as we are able to seize it. Now, did you notice how the Jesuit order at Cherie, how they viewed the King James Bible? They said again, that the King James Version is a serpent or a snake that gives out its venom. And they said, we have a goal, and that is to change the King James Version of the Bible. How would they do that? They would do that by introducing many different versions of Scripture. For three centuries past, the Jesuits declared, this cruel asp has left us no repose. You well know with what folds it entwines us and with what fangs it gnaws us. So the Jesuit order views the King James Version of the Bible as a slithering snake that needs to be destroyed and the way they would destroy it would be by introducing different versions of the Bible. Now, from a book that I feel is a very good authority, our authorized Bible vindicated by Dr. B.G. Wilkinson a man who in his own right understood the influence and the infiltration of the Jesuit order. In fact, let me just tell you a little story before I quote from his book. Dr. Wilkinson was the president of Columbia Union College up in Washington, D.C. in the middle 1940s. One day, as he was walking by to his office, he was met by several young theology majors, and they said, Dr. Wilkinson, we have real concern. They said, one new teacher in our college is telling us all kinds of different things that are different from what the other theology teachers are teaching us. And it, the, the young student said, what this new theology professor is saying, he's opening us up to all kinds of questions, but giving us no answers. So Dr. Wilkinson said thank you to the young men, and they left. Well, several days later, Dr. Wilkinson was going down towards his office, right past the wall where all the teachers had their little mailboxes. And as he went by, a voice said to him, you need to get a letter out of the new teacher's mailbox. Well, Dr. Wilkinson was a man of integrity, and he thought in his mind, he began to argue with his mind, and he said, no, I don't, I don't pull mail out of people's mailboxes. The voice said, pull the piece of mail 
out of the new theology teacher's mailbox. Well, Dr. Wilkinson did that. He took the piece of mail, went into his office, opened it up, and Dr. Wilkinson read a detailed description as to exactly what this young man was supposed to teach in his theology classes. And the letterhead at the top of the piece of paper, it was the letterhead of a major Jesuit college in Washington, D.C. Dr. Wilkinson sealed back up the envelope, put it back in the young man's mailbox. A few weeks or a week later, he called the young man into his office and he said, I know exactly who you are. I know exactly where you're from. I know exactly who's giving you orders as to what you're supposed to teach at this college. And Dr. Wilkinson said, we do not want you here. You are not welcomed. And your time at this college is over. The young man did not say a word. He rose from his seat, went out the door, and Dr. Wilkinson never saw him again. And that was in the middle of the 1940s. So if that was happening in the 1940s, and we see this incredible shifting in what Seventh-day Adventists have believed and taught down through the years. Are we going to be so naive as to believe that the Jesuit order has stopped trying to infiltrate among God's professed people? If we are, then I have several bridges in Brooklyn that I want to sell just to you. Now, from Dr. Wilkinson's book, on page 99 of the book, he quotes from a gentleman by the name of Von Dobschutz. The book is called The Influence of the Bible, page 136. This is what it says. Wherever the Counter-Reformation, which was started by the Jesuits, gained hold of the people, the vernacular was suppressed and the Bible kept from the laity. So eager were the Jesuits to destroy the authority of the Bible, the paper pope of the Protestant, as they contemptuously called it, that they even did not refrain from criticizing its genuineness and historical value. So according to Deb Schutz, in his book, The Influence of the Bible, page 136, the Jesuits' desire was to suppress and to destroy the authority of the King James Bible. Now, Something to keep in mind as we look this afternoon at different Bibles. The King James Bible, of course, was a product of Protestant England. And when was the King James Bible originally published? When was it? Just say it out loud. Okay, 1611. That was the original publishing of the King James Version of the Bible. Now... Over the centuries, because of the archaic language of the King James Bible and the very dominant English in the original 1611 translation, there's no question that the Bible we have today, this King James Bible, comes from the 1611, but it obviously has been revised. At least three or four times revisions have been made to the 1611 version so that we can read it in our American English language today. 
But the King James Version of the Bible that came into being in 1611 was the product of a 50, at least a 50-year struggle between Catholicism and Protestantism in England. We could go down through the history of the various kings. You have Edward VI, who was the only son of Henry VIII. He ruled from 1547 to 1553. He was a Protestant. Then, from 1553 to 1558, his half-sister Mary, or Bloody Mary, came into power. She was Catholic. Then, from 1558 down to 1603, was the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, or Queen Elizabeth, And that was a time when England was very, very Protestant. There was a war that raged in England from 1550 all the way down to the early 1600s. And Protestantism won. And the King James Version of the Bible was an outgrowth of the victory of Protestantism in England. To the contrary... The revised versions of the Bible, whether it be just the plain old revised version or the American Standard Version, um, the Living Bible, the Moffat Translation, Phillips Translation, the Amplified Version, uh, all of those Bibles were the product of committees that came about in England from 1880 and afterwards. And between the time of 1830 down to 1850, there was a titanic struggle in England between Protestantism and Catholicism. And in that 50-year struggle, Catholicism won. So the revised versions of the Bible, whichever one you, pick and you can pick or choose, all of those revised versions of the Bible came about as a result of Catholicism winning out in England. So the King James Bible is the result of victorious Protestantism, the revised versions are the product of the victory of Catholicism in England. Two different centuries, two different results. Now, what I'd like to show you now is the place where, from where we get the King James Bible from history. And then we're going to look at where all the revised versions of the Bible have come from as well. As you know, well, let me ask, and you can just shout it out. When was Jerusalem destroyed? When was that? 87. 70 A.D. Thank you, Graham. That's exactly right. 70 A.D. And do you remember from Matthew 24? In fact, let's read that together. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse 15 through 18. Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 18. Jesus declared, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Now, Jesus warned. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel standing in the holy place, get ready to go. So Christ said, when that event occurred, 
the children of Israel should take flight and get out of Jerusalem. And that's exactly what they did. Now, just for a little bit of background, the abomination of desolation that stood in the holy place, the holy place in Israel, in Jerusalem, it extended several miles outside the city walls. Okay? You'll read that in the book, Great Controversy. I believe it's around page 30, 36, 37. Does somebody have a king, uh, great controversy here? Okay, nobody does? Okay. Um, the holy place extended several furlongs or several miles outside the city wall, and the abomination of desolation was set up in the first century in 66 AD when a Roman soldier... Can I borrow that? I'll read that to you. A Roman soldier, thank you. Let's see here. Okay, here it is. Now, okay, this is uh, pages 25 to 27 in the regular Great Controversy. It says here, The Savior warned his followers, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now Ellen White says this, or the Spirit of God, When the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. Okay? Now what happened was this. In 66 AD, the Roman soldiers came into the area of the holy ground or in the area of the holy place outside the city and they set up a Roman standard outside the city. Now do you know what was on a Roman standard? Guess. There was some sign. Guess what the sign was on the Roman standard? IHS. No, it wasn't, Graham. It's a good try, though. What it was, it was a sun dial. It was a sun dial. And when that was set up, because the Romans worshipped the sun god, so when that Roman standard was set up in the holy place, that sundial was put there, the Christians were to make ready to flee. And what happened in 66 AD? The Romans set up the standard, and for who knows what reason, right after they set it up, they took off and headed back towards Rome. You see? That gave the Christians the opportunity to flee out of Jerusalem. And that's what they did. And they fled to areas beyond the Jordan in places like Pella and uh, the, the place of the ten cities. It skips my mind at the moment. It was at Pella where the Christians fled. And it was at Pella where the first manuscripts of the Bible were taken. And from there, original manuscripts were then taken to Syria, to Antioch. And it was there that the New Testament was put together. This is around the 3rd or 4th century. The Syrian church at Antioch had the correct translation of the Bible. From the Syrian churches around the 3rd century... Those manuscripts of the Bible were then taken to Germany. They were taken to Italy. They were taken to France. They were even taken to England. And it was from these manuscripts, these translations of the Bible, from Syria, that were taken over to Europe, it was from those that the Waldenses translated their Bible.
And it was from the very Bible that the Waldenses spread throughout Europe. It was from that Bible, from those translations, that Erasmus, the great thinker of the 16th century, made his translations of the New Testament. It was from the Waldensee's Bible that was spread through Europe that Martin Luther translated the Bible into German. It was from the Waldensee's Bible that William Tyndale translated the Bible into English. And it was from the Bible that was predominantly done by William Tyndale that the, the people who wrote the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, that's where it came from. So we can see from the early disciples that left Jerusalem in 70 A.D., made their way to Syria with the, the manuscripts of the Bible. They were then collected together in Syria in the third century. And from there, they were taken throughout Europe. And you can see a train from Jerusalem to Syria, to Italy, to England, to Germany, to France. And it was from those that came the King James Version of the Bible. By the way, what do you think will be the latter day abomination of desolation on which God's people are told, when you see this happen, get ready to flee if in the first century it was a sun dial representing sun worship, what do you think the latter day abomination of desolation will be that will be assigned to people to get out of cities? What do you think it'll be? It will be Sunday laws. That's right. Sunday laws. Now, let's take a look at the other stream. The other stream, the first stream went from Syria to Italy to England to France to Luther to Tyndale to the King James Version of the Bible. Now in Acts chapter 20, I want you to notice what Paul warned the church in Ephesus. Acts chapter 20. Verse 8 through 30. Paul said to the church at Ephesus, he said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. So Paul warned the early church, he said, when I die... You better watch out because there are going to be people who will come in who will be like wolves and they will devour you up. That's what Paul warned the church at Ephesus. And that is just about exactly what happened. It didn't happen at the time when Paul died because Paul died around 63 A.D., but after John, the beloved disciple, died, the one who was the writer of the book of Revelation, he died about 100 A.D. And after he died, the Christian church became game 
for hungry wolves. And some of those hungry wolves had names like these. One was a man by the name of Justin Martyr, another man by the name of Tatian, two other men, one Clement of Alexandria, and a fourth one whose name was Origen. These four men, these four men did more to destroy the manuscripts of Scripture in the first five centuries of the Christian era. After the death of John, these four men came in and made all kinds of strange and weird additions to the manuscripts that were available at that time. And so, while the pure text stayed pure in Syria and made its way through Europe, there was a corrupting stream as well. And the four men I mentioned, they all lived in succession of one another. They all taught one another. And they would mix in their philosophy, their paganism, their mythology, and they would mix that into their translation. You see, folk, and we could look at our King James Bible. How many of us believe in a place called hell? How many of us believe there's a place called hell? Is that where people are going to burn forever and ever? No, it's not. You see, the people that wrote the King James Version of the Bible believed in an everlasting burning hell. And so when they would write in the Bible and they would see the word grave that should rightly be interpreted grave, they had biases too. And so they would put in the word hell or everlasting punishment because that was their bias. That was their leaning. We believe people will, when they die, do they go to hell when they die? No. They go to the grave. So every Bible, whether it's the King James or any Bible, they do have their bias. Unfortunately, unfortunately, these men, the Justin Martyr, Clement, Origen, and then Jerome, all of these men brought into their translations paganism, philosophy, Greek mythology, and it really messed up the translations. Fortunately, there was a pure text, as pure as it could be, that came through that brought us to our King James Bible today. From the time of Jerome... In about the 5th century, down to the Council of Trent in 1545 to 1563, we find this blending of all kinds of ideas from different places, mixing in with translations, and from those we arrived at a Vatican manuscript, the Sinaitic manuscript, the Vulgate, or the Latin Bible. And it was from there that we then come down to 1582, and we have the Jesuit Bible called the Douay Version, which is the English Jesuit version of the Bible. And from there... From the Jesuit version of the Bible in 1582, it was from that Bible and that stream 
come all the other versions of Scripture. All of them. Revised version, American Standard, American Revised, Living Bible, Amplified, New Jerusalem, Moffat, Phillips, all of them come through that stream. It was during the time of the Council of Trent, 1545 under the Counter-Reformation, the Jesuits condemned the Protestants' teachings on the Scriptures. I'd like, you to, like to read just a little bit of that to you. At the Council of Trent, this is what the Catholic Church and the Jesuit order declared. Number one, that the Holy Scriptures contained all things necessary for salvation and that it was impious to place apostolic tradition on a level with Scripture. Now you believe that, don't you? The Jesuit order condemned that. They condemned that. They believed that apostolic tradition or Catholic tradition and the Bible are equal. Number two at the Council of Trent. They condemned the idea that certain books accepted as canonical in the Vulgate were apocryphal and not canonical. What that simply means is the Protestant reformers believed that certain books that had been added to the Bible, like um, the book of Enoch, um, the book of, oh, like Judah Maccabees, or the book of Maccabees, these are all a part of what is called the Apocrypha. Those were added to the Bible by the Jesuit translators. And the Catholic Church condemned the Reformers because the Reformers rejected the apocryphal writings. Number three, they condemned the idea that the scriptures must be studied in the original languages and that there were errors in the Vulgate. The Vulgate, of course, was the Catholic translation of the Bible during the Dark Ages. And number four, the Jesuits condemn the idea that the meaning of Scripture is plain. They say it's not plain. And they said the only way you could understand Scripture is by the church fathers. The Protestants said any man can understand the Bible for himself. Now, there have been many benefits of the Protestant King James Version of the Bible. Number one, as a result of the King James Version of the Bible, foreign missionaries have gone around the world. There's been a rise of a middle class. There has been Republican government. And there have been many humanitarian groups that have arisen out around the world, like the YMCA or the, uh, the YWCA um, the uh, Salvation Army, all of those have been a result of the Protestant King James Version of the Bible. The curses that have come in under Catholicism and the revised versions of the Bible have been persecution, degradation of the poor, tyranny with dictatorship and absolute rule, and the destruction of society. Those have been the fruits of Catholicism and Catholic revisions of the Bible. Now I'd like to take a look at just a few. We noticed a few last time. I want to look at them again. Some of the things that the Jesuit versions have omitted from the King James Bible. 
you would like to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13. This, of course, is in the Lord's Prayer. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 13. Matthew 6.13 says, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That's the King James Version. In the Jesuit Version of 1582, their verse simply reads, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The American Revised Version, notice how, caref how closely it ties with the Jesuit Version. It says, and bring us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Big difference, isn't there? The Jesuit and American Revision are basically identical. Now, what did the two revised versions leave out? They left out these words, For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now what does the end of that verse say? Who does it identify who will set up his kingdom? Who does it identify? Say it. Our Father. Our Father. And who do we think of when we say our Father? God. So our, but the King James Version says that God is going to set up His kingdom and He will rule the world. But who does the Catholic Church think is going to rule the world? God? No. The Pope. One of the reasons why the Jews have been killed for centuries by the Catholic Church is because the Jews believe when their Messiah comes, he's going to set up his kingdom. And so the Catholic Church kills the Jew because if all the Jews are destroyed, then who will the Messiah come to set up his kingdom for? So the Catholic translations leave out the fact that Christ has a kingdom that he is going to set up. Let's take a look at another one. Luke chapter 2 and verse 33. Luke chapter 2 and verse 33. The King James Bible says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. The Jesuit version says, And his father and mother were marveling upon those things which were spoken concerning him. The American Revised Version of 1901 says, And his father and his mother were marveling at the things which were spoken concerning him. Once again, you see the similarity between the Jesuit and the American Revised Version. Almost identical. Now, what did they change from the King James to the Jesuit and the American Revised Version? They made Joseph Christ's father. Biologically speaking, did Jesus have an earthly father? No, no he did not. And so by the way they translate it, you take away the fact that Christ had a miracle birth. Luke chapter 4 and verse 8, another passage that is shot at. Luke chapter 4, Luke chapter 4 and verse 8. The King James Bible says, 
And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The Jesuit Bible of 1582 says, And Jesus answering said to him, It is written, Thou shalt adore the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. The American Revised of 1901 says, And Jesus answered and said to him, It is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. What did the Jesuit and the American Revised Version leave out? Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Okay? Why? Can you remember another time in, in Scripture... In Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus said, I'm going up to Jerusalem because it's time for me to die. And Peter took him aside and said, Be it far from thee, Lord. May it not happen to thee. And Jesus turned and rebuked him. And what did he say? He said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. So the very same term that Christ used here in Luke chapter 4 that he applied to the devil in Matthew chapter 16, the very same term was applied at Peter. And who did the Catholic Church feel their church was founded on? Peter. And so they get rid of the term because it's getting just a little bit too close to their founding father. And so they take out the term, get thee behind me, Satan. All right, let's take a look at one more. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. The King James Bible says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. The Jesuit version reads, Purge the old leaven that you may be a new paste as you are unleavened. For our posh, Christ is immolated. The American Revised says, Purge out the old leaven that ye may be a new lump even as ye are unleavened. For our Passover also hath been sacrificed even Christ. Now what was the very small but significant phrase that was left out of the Jesuit Bible and the American Revised Version? Did you notice? No. It was the word, the two words for us. For us. In neither of the Catholic Bibles do you find, find the words for us. And those are the very heart, it's the very heart of our hope for this life, for forgiveness, for comfort from Christ, and our hope for the world to come is that Christ died for us. Both Catholic Bibles leave that very important phrase out. And those two words are the very center of the gospel message. We can be very thankful today that down through the centuries, in the war that has raged, on the Word of God, we can be so thankful today that we still have the authoritative Word of God that has come down through centuries 
and I rejoice that it's still intact in 2002. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, help us to hunger and thirst after this word. Help us to hide this word in our hearts that we might not sin against thee. Thank you that if we continue in this word, we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. Thank you that by this word we can be cleansed. We can be changed forever. Bless us all with that experience and help us. Help us to defend the great King James Bible that has come down to us through so much suffering. Help us to be willing to suffer. In Christ's name we pray, amen.